So welcome back. Uh, we're here with Winford Dorr. We're talking about the cerebellum. Welcome again to Cerebellar Week, uh, to the Rodney Dangerfield part of the brain <laughs> that people just don't care about. Uh, and it's interesting. When I first started imaging the brain, it was actually 1988, and I learned about nerve feedback. Yeah. And nerve feedback is a tool where we put electrodes on yeah. the scalp and show people their brainwave activity and then teach them to change it. Mm. And so from there, I learned about quantitative EEG, and I really liked that. It was mm. a new way to look at the brain. Mm. Mm. But EEG doesn't look at all at the cerebellum. Sure. And when we started doing spec scans in 1991, now it's giving this really great view of the cerebellum. Mm. And the medicine we use, Serotech, to do the scans at Amon Clinics, it lights up the cerebellum. Yeah. So it's the best imaging study if you want to look at the cerebellum. And we just saw so many yeah. problems that yeah. could be fixed. Yeah. I mean, that was the exciting thing. I yeah. showed you a case earlier. Yeah. Winford and I were hanging out today. Uh, I showed you a case of a woman who'd been diagnosed with ADD by six different doctors, had her on mm. six different stimulants. Mm. I'm thinking somebody's got a learning problem, talking mm. about learning problems. Um, you know, after three, you think, okay, this isn't mm. the right thing. Mm. And when she came to see me, she had a cerebellar tumor. Mm. And her whole brain was low in blood flow mm. because the tumor had disrupted mm. her cerebellum and the mm. cerebellum then disrupted yeah. the rest of her brain. And when they took out the tumor, her ADD went away. Yeah. I mean, it was really stunning yeah. how helpful that was. So, you know, so the cerebellum is just so important. So as you come to this finding to help your daughter, so how is she now? She, she is fine. In fact, she's still making great progress. You know, she, she went through a period of a few months where she was able to start reading. And that was kind of foundational and, and writing. Then she started being able to communicate with other people because her confidence was going up. Because one of the things we see is that, that very often those who are struggling with learning have low levels of self-esteem. And not many people realize that there's a direct link between your ability to automatize skill and how you feel about yourself. So whilst we were focusing initially on Susie's reading issues, we suddenly realized that this cerebellum or the brain within the brain, as some call it, was, was actually impacting so many of the other symptoms that we didn't realize were connected. So her mood swings, her depression, her writing ability, her reading ability, her ability to be organized and be structured was all impacted by the cerebellum. So when we started stimulating that and developing that, Susie became more of a natural, more confident, more outgoing person. The cerebellum, you actually call it in your book, the brain's brain. I do, yeah. Which I think is, is well, it's fascinating. A bit, it's, it's like the electrician that sits at the back here and just hardwires everything up. And, and you know, fortunately, it is very, very few that have cerebellar tumors. That's very rare. Very rare. But one in five will have their cerebellum underdeveloped, and it will show us poor attention, poor reading, poor writing, poor organization, and so on. So the, all of these other symptoms can be attributed back to incomplete development of the cerebellum. And that's what's so exciting is that I want to stop people thinking that if you've got a child or if you're an adult and struggling with these symptoms, that it's because of low levels of intelligence. It's often the opposite. And mums, you know, those warrior mums that are out there, they often see this intelligence in the child and they, find, they think, why isn't the school finding this? You know, we expect the education system or the medical system to be proactive at resolving these issues, and they aren't. They struggle, and they children struggle, and adults struggle, and often they go right through life without this being found. So, so how does the hope. cerebellum develop? I live next door to a farm, and every spring I go there and I watch some lambs being born and start running. You know, they're within minutes of being born, they're feeding, they're standing up, and the next day they're out in the field and they're running around and jumping. Their cerebellum is highly developed from birth, whereas in humans, it's not. It's almost completely undeveloped. And so what takes a lamb a day will take a human two years to get the same level of ability to jump around and so on. So it's no wonder that 
different aspects of the development of the cerebellum is going to vary in the speed with which it develops. So when I see a child or an adult that's struggling with incomplete development of the cerebellum, I only think of it as a delay, and actually I think of it as a positive. So I don't tend to use the labels dyslexia and autism anymore because I see huge potential. So I, I just see that there's been a delay for some reason, whatever it is, just do the right things and you can continue that development and often with unbelievably exciting results, as I saw in my own daughter. So crawling helps to oh, I didn't stimulate the, the cerebellum. Yes. So what a child is doing those early months of its life is naturally doing the vestibular type stimulation and coordination activities that develops the cerebellum. So often you find that children that manifest at five, six, seven years of age struggles with, say, reading or other learning issues, often you can identify that they have bypassed a specific exercise that they should have been doing. So, you know, my this is a tragic admission on my own part. My oldest daughter, Susie, we put her in a baby walker, so she didn't do much crawling. And she struggled. Now, that may have been a coincidence, but I do know when I talk to parents, so many of the children that struggle with fundamental learning issues actually bypassed some of the crawling phase. Or, conversely, sometimes they crawled for far too long and they were delayed in walking, delayed in speaking, and so on. So it's what's happening those early months appears to be driving the development of the cerebellum in a natural and a complete way. And if you bypass it, you can do and you've got to go back at a later stage in life and complete that development so that this brain within the brain can do its job. So you just gave me a horrifying idea. Oh, good. That when Elias was born, he's my eight-year-old grandson who I adore, um, and his parents, who I love dearly, you know, they'd give him the cell phone. And he mm. was mm. completely addicted to this thing. Mm. And so we've just known not to give him mm. a gadget. Mm. Um, but early on, um, so many kids now are either in front yep. of the television, yep. in front of the yep. iPad, in front of the computer, yep. in front of the smartphone. We should call these dumb phones. Mm. Um, and so they're not getting the same level Absolutely. of physical exercise. Absolutely. Uh, they're not getting the same, they're getting a different level of cerebellar activation than if they're exactly doing exercise. Absolutely. Um, you know, not thumb exercise. There's actually a study that says the thumb representation in the brain has become larger since we've yeah. introduced gadgets. Yeah. And, you know, who needs a larger thumb representation? Well, a monkey, if you're in a tree, yeah. not humans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I wonder, and I'd love your thoughts on this, is the introduction of gadgets in mm. the Middle Ages, uh, does that in some way correlate with the skyrocketing number of kids who have ADD and learning problems um, because they're not getting the physical mm. cerebellar development. You know, I never really thought about that until just this moment. Mm. Talking to you is, um, what do you think? I think that there's, there's always a propensity for there to be some learning issue, and the greater the propensity, the more likely it is to happen. But then nurture comes into it, and if you do give a child an excuse to be sedentary and not stimulate the vestibular for long periods, then you're not giving the cerebellum a chance. And so... How interesting. So exercise at every age yeah. is critical to brain development. And mm. we, we've just seen that. It's sort of the universal treatment for depression. Head-to-head -head yeah. against antidepressants, they're equally effective. Yeah. For attention all problems. Yeah. Well, what all, all we've done... Uh, Dr. Amen is to systematically create the right exercise, the right level of stimulation into a program so that we can take people from wherever they are to a higher level of development of the cerebellum. So I'm a huge, huge fan of exercise. And in fact, the American government did a wonderful report a few years ago for schools saying, giving all sorts of examples of proven research showing how exercise transforms kids. What happens in schools? They took exercise out of schools to save money. 
It's like they took music out of schools when I was growing up, probably yeah. you too. Mm -hmm. The music was just sort of part yeah. of the curriculum. Yeah. And now it's it's not anymore. Yeah. So I want to, in this podcast, I want to talk about some stories. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you think back on all the people that have done mm -hmm. your program, are there a couple of stories mm -hmm. that stand out? There, there's so many um, the, the, the first one that comes to mind I'll tell you about is, a, is a, a guy called Jim. He was in his 40s and he'd been severely autistic. He just followed his parents around uh, very, very quietly, wouldn't speak to anybody. They had to wash him, feed him, dress him and so on. And they were in their 70s and he, they were afraid to get old. And they worked with him. Normally it takes us 6 to 12 months. In their case it took a couple of years. But at the end of two years... Jim was going off to London on his own to see his sister and he was at college studying to be a chef. And the, the, the parents came to me one day and they said, you know what, we're no longer worried about getting old. Wow. Because we know that Jim can look after himself. And that was, I was just in floods of tears. So the impact, impact poor learning has on people is huge. And the impact of... And their families. Oh. The worry that... I have a handicapped granddaughter, right. uh, Emmy, who I think our followers know about. She was born with a genetic microdeletion syndrome. Mm -hmm. And when she was five months old, she had mm -hmm. um, wicked seizures. One day she oh, had 160 my. of them. Wow. And they said she wouldn't walk and... On the ketogenic diet, she just did so well. Really? And, but she still has developmental delays. Mm. And when I scanned her at nine months old, yeah. she just had nothing going on in her cerebellum. Mm. So I'm going to see if I can get her mom to do this oh, program. Oh, wonderful. I think it could be helpful for her. Um, well, we, we, the second story that comes to mind is one actually in, in Australia, one in our Sydney clinic, and it was a girl that had uh, severe um, cerebellar hyperplasia, and she. It, it took them a couple of years, and I, I still keep the videos and occasionally look at them where she's went from not just going around in a in a frame. Now she she can actually run and function, and. It is thrilling. That brings tears to my eyes as well. I cry easily because, you know, having watched my own daughter wanting to die, it makes you realize the pain that individuals and families face. Oh, it's, it's just devastating. It, it um, reminds me of this story of a kid I saw. So I was at a, a cocktail party mm. and, you know, our group knows I don't drink. So I was having sparkling water mm. and just talking to these very nice people and all of a sudden they realized who i was and they told me about their son who didn't get pancakes in the morning mm. and he had to have his way or he got really upset and he chased his mother around the house for 40 minutes with a butcher knife and i'm like oh my god i said you should bring him to see me and so mm. they brought alex to see me and um, when he was three, he had a cerebellar tumor. Wow. And so I know this is my second tumor story. Yeah, yeah. He had a cerebellar tumor. They took it out, but they didn't get it all. So they had to go back wow. in. And on the second time when they back in, he developed meningitis. Wow. And the meningitis just killed his left temporal lobe. Mm. Your temporal lobe's underneath your temples and behind your eyes. And he developed wicked seizures. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, people who have autistic kids can relate to it. Yeah. The kid doesn't get his way and get very aggressive. And, um, and when I scanned him, I could see the cerebellar, cerebellum missing. Mm -hmm. His left temporal lobe was clearly damaged. That's mm -hmm. where the seizures mm -hmm. came from. But his anterior cingulate gyrus, um, it's your gear shifter in the front part of your brain, was freaking on fire. I mean, wow. it just looked like it had seizure activity. Yeah. It was so yeah. active. And when I calmed down his cingulate, I use Lexapro to do that, um, increases anticonvulsant. He did so much better. Wow. But now that I know about your yeah. program, I'm like, well, that, he, yeah. you know, his cerebellum was clearly damaged yeah. from this tumor from the surgery that to reprogram it, 
should have been yeah. part of his rehabilitation program. And that's yeah. why I was so excited to spend time with you well, because I've just seen the cerebellum to be so troubled. Yeah. And nobody cares about it, which is It's the poor bizarre. relation. It is. And the professor who put this on the map was Jeremy Schmarman at Harvard Medical School many years ago. It took him years to get his first papers published. And that's the scary thing about research. Very often it takes generations before it reaches those that need it. And that's scary. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a uh, board member of the REACH Institute in New York. And the whole point of that is so that cutting edge research doesn't get left for two or three generations before it reaches the people that, that need it. So I, I, can I just share with you one more story? And it's, it's a very personal one. It's my, my, I met my soulmate, Ninka Moritz, and she's from Denmark just uh, two and a half years ago. Her oldest son, uh, he'd been thrown out of, sorry, her youngest son, he'd been thrown out of five schools in Denmark. And when I met him, I could see a bright guy that had learned nothing, huge maths anxiety, and he just didn't know anything about science and so on, but clearly had got intellect. Well, to cut a long story short, he's actually up at the school I own in England right now, but the most important thing that happened is that he did the Zing program. And all of the reasons he was misunderstood, all of his inability to learn has been transformed. He'd got a perfect brain, waiting for the cerebellum to be wired up so that his learning circuits were activated. He's caught up in two years. He's doing in what in England is called the GCSE exams right now, and they're predicting he's going to pass a lot of them. Well, and I've talked to his mother, and she is just a raving fan <laughs> uh, of your work. So stay with us. Yeah. We're in the middle of Cerebellum Week. When yeah. we come back, we're going to talk about how you can activate your cerebellum, yeah. your vestibular system to have the best overall brain yeah. possible. Stay with us. Yeah.